two friends, Alan Dale and Jerry Carew, who grew up just a few streets apart in St. John's East End, have been separated by Canada's geography for three decades. They came together virtually during the pandemic to chat about like-minded interests. Alan lives in PEI and Jerry in Newfoundland. Thriving in remoteness has been a common theme for both of them during the pandemic. Gale Force wins. The podcast is the result. Welcome to Gale Force Wins. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of meeting all kinds of people. Super intelligent people and people you just want to go to supper with. Our next guest, Dr. Adam Fennick, is the type of person that's super intelligent and the kind of guy you just want to go to supper with. Adam Fennick has a lot of accomplishments, but not everybody can say or can use Nobel Prize in their accomplishment list. We're very excited to have Dr. Adam Fennick on the show. And welcome to Gale Force Winds. Uh, very excited to be on the podcast again today. How are you, Jerry? I'm doing really well, Alan. Thank you. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you as well. There comes a point, you know, where we have to stop saying Happy New Year. Other, we'll be <laughs> dating ourselves. And I don't know if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, but Larry David is very specific about when the Happy New Year must end. I think it's around the fourth. I think we just cut it under the wire. So that's well, where listen it's, it's funny uh, in a podcast, Adam, we shouldn't really be referring to time because we're not quite sure when we're going to put it up, which could be a couple of weeks. So this, that Happy New Year might be totally out of date by then. But let's, and, and, given, given it's 2021 though, let's say Happy New Year all the time. Huh? And quite exactly, and quite honestly, the podcast is timeless, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Stand the test of time. Listen, we're uh, incredibly excited to have uh, our next guest on the show. You know, we it's funny, you live in these remote parts of Canada. I myself, I'm Prince Edward Island, Jerry's in St. John's, Newfoundland, and uh, we live on these little islands and occasionally across paths with people that kind of scratch your head and say well that particular guy could have lived anywhere why did he choose this small island to live why is he uh traveling in the circles with us what what is it about our place that uh, he finds so intriguing well that indeed is our next guest and not many of our guests uh over the course of uh, our podcast thus far can use the term nobel peace prize winner uh, in their title but indeed adam fennick can indeed do that he was part of a team that uh, was awarded that and we're certainly going to dive into that a little bit deeper we're very excited to have dr adam fennick on the show with us tonight adam how are you tonight well happy new year Happy New Year to you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those who always say, is it too late to uh, say Happy New Year? But, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, taping this uh, early on in 2021, so I'll extend a Happy New Year to both of you. Well, uh, we'll post it in April just to make it more effective. <laughs> Adam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I come from an immigrant family. My, uh, I'm the only one born in Canada. I was born and raised in the city of Toronto. Uh, I never thought of it as living downtown, but nowadays they call it downtown Toronto. Um, so I'm much like you, a little surprised that I'm living somewhat uh, remotely, kind of in the middle of nowhere on beautiful Prince Edward Island. So, and uh, I, I was a, a PhD climatologist. I studied climate. I worked with Environment Canada for about 25 years and then uh, was offered a position at the University of Prince Edward Island a little earlier than I'd anticipated, uh, but I kind of jumped at the opportunity. So Adam, you, you were a PhD climatologist. Climate change is a pretty topical thing and for good reason right now you know you could have lived anywhere you could have put your finger on a map and said i'm going there and i will do my work there why here why atlantic canada what about it intrigued you yeah you are you are correct um i mean because of climate change my services my uh, knowledge is, is certainly in demand and so i could you know i do get offers i get offers all around the world 
Um, and, and not to boast, but I, you know, I probably could work anywhere. Um, I choose here probably because of its beauty more than anything. Um, you know, I, I vacationed for the first time on Prince Edward Island around the year 2007. I remember driving around and looking at the homes and beautiful rolling hills and thinking, you know, I'd, it would be really wonderful to live and work here. And I thought, you know, there's not a chance in heck that I'll ever get that opportunity. And let's put that away. So, you know, just uh, about four years later, that's how, <laughs> that's how the universe listens to us. About four years later, I was, I was given uh, the opportunity and I had to weigh a lot of things. You know, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I, you know, grew up in uh, downtown Toronto. I was used to the the, the, you know, the tall buildings and the, the, the nasty traffic. And, you know, my friends, they thought I was nuts. They took a poll, <laughs> actually. They took a poll and said, uh, a pool and said, uh, you know, how long do you think Phoenix is going to last? And some <laughs> said a week, some said two weeks. The furthest out was six weeks. <laughs> and I was, I was really insulted. I said, how could you say that? And they said, Adam, you're the most urban person we know. You know, you're the guy that goes to opera. You go to all the new restaurants. You, you engage in the city. You love it here. Um, you know, why, you know, we just never thought that you were moving. But it was, uh, it was a wonderful choice that I made and uh, very few regrets, if any at all, about making that choice. It was a difficult one. It wasn't a difficult one. It came naturally. Um, but there were certainly some, you know, the, the pros and con lists I had to go through. Uh, and uh, there were some very pleasant surprises that make me sing um, Prince Edward Island's praises constantly now. Yeah, it's so true. And for a guest, I live in Prince Edward Island. My My story is not quite as beautiful is what Adam just described. <laughs> Simply put, I, I married an island girl and that's pretty much like marrying a vegetarian. Makes you a vegetarian, so <laughs> that made me an islander. So that's why I'm here, but actually I quite love PEI and I love I love the people, I love the place, I, I love everything about it. And, and I love the fact that more people like you, Adam, see quite a great deal of value in Atlantic Canada and what our little culture, our little way of life has to offer so many people. Adam, you've traveled around the world. And, and uh, one of my fondest memories of you and I, we actually traveled together in a number of locations, but was in uh, Sri Lanka. And it was, uh, you probably don't remember it, but uh, I do. And uh, we were having dinner together. And it was actually the night that my mom passed away. And I had to catch an emergency flight back to Canada uh, from Sri Lanka, and there was uh, just two people uh, when that happened that reached out to me, and you were one of them, and it meant a great deal to me. And uh, so uh, that taught me a little lesson about Adam Fennec, that Adam Fennec is not just some highfalutin PhD climatologist. In fact, Adam Fennec's a pretty decent guy, pretty decent guy, and we're lucky to have him around us. Adam, tell us a little bit about what's going on in our climate right now. There's a lot of, you know, I mean, you could be completely consumed by the new, well, not, not lately, they've seemed to shift it away with Donald Trump in office, but you can really be consumed by the news around climate change. Tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what's happening. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not new to this game, Alan. Um, you know, I've been involved in the climate change game for 32 years now. Uh, time, time flies when you're having fun. And believe me, it hasn't been fun the whole time. It, it, it all started when uh, in Toronto, we had something called the Toronto Conference on the Changing Atmosphere. And, you know, we, even climate change wasn't even the main thing uh, it, to be examined. We were looking at uh, issues, other environmental issues like acid rain, uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. But we were coming off like some really great uh, positive news with scientists getting together and saying, you know, we've, you know, stratospheric ozone is depleting and we have to do something about it. And working with uh, policymakers, we're able to put in some reductions on those ozone depleting substances. Um, it, it, it's 
doesn't get enough um, play, I don't think, because we, you know humanity was really at the cusp of uh, some real damage and would have changed our lives significantly more than, than COVID is at the moment. Um, and so it, it led me to have the optimism that scientists and policymakers can come together and solve issues. Um, but what came out of that Toronto conference back in 1988 was saying that climate change, uh, that humanity was, was conducting uh, an unintended experiment whose um, implications were, uh, were second only to global thermonuclear war. So, you know, that's a very strong statement. And they started saying that we should really be reducing our greenhouse gases back then. Um, and so over that time, uh, the science uh, really got boosted up onto the public agenda and onto the international uh, climate agenda as well. Uh, the issue we had, though, is that we really weren't seeing the climate change. We Scientists were anticipating the climate's going to change, we're going to start seeing impacts, mm -hmm. but it was just scientists saying this. We weren't seeing it. And in fact, um, probably the most famous climatologist in the world, uh, Jim Hansen, a uh, US scientist, he appeared before uh, a Senate committee and he said that he was 50% sure, so only 50% sure that uh, the humans were contributing to the increase in uh, temperatures and climate. But that seemed to be enough. It really got discussions going. But when you start thinking about, you know, virtually everything that we do, our whole lifestyle, uh, how we live, how we work, how we heat our homes, cool our homes, drive, how we get around transportation, all of that contributes to climate change. And so nobody, you know, countries or individuals just weren't interested in doing anything about it. That is until we've started to see these changes occurring. And they're occurring a lot faster than we'd anticipated. Mm. Um, so it's starting to make climatologists like myself a little scared. Mm. Um, if you notice, there's been a, it's been a little quiet, not just because of COVID, but after the last couple of years, because you know we're starting to see hurricanes, category five hurricanes, making landfall, killing hundreds of people that we've never seen before. We're starting to see forest fires, you know, again and again and again, places like California and Australia, unprecedented. Um, and even living on this uh, beautiful little island of Prince Edward Island, uh, we're really feeling the impacts of climate change quite mm -hmm. significantly. So I think, I think the public is coming around to saying we really need to do something about this. And, and they sure are, or at least many are, for, for sure. It's uh, I find it um, I find it fascinating that there's still people that don't believe that it's happening around them. I mean, it's, you can see it, you can almost touch it, you, you know. But yet, there's certain people, and they, these are not uh, these smart people, people around me that you know that 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 deny this. How do you? How do you counter that? How do you, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by that. Well, I, I really don't face many people like that, tell you the truth. Um, here on PEI, because we're so connected to the environment, mm -hmm. um, here uh, people come to me and say, hey, I'm witnessing this. What can you tell me about it? Are you studying any of that? Um, I find that uh, human beings are so much... Um, uh, encasing themselves into uh, an unnatural controlled environment, you know, but with heating and air conditioning and everything else, that they don't really feel or aren't connected to the environment enough to see the signals that the environment is telling us about. Um, you know, it's a, it's a rude awakening. I mean, if, if you do have all of these uh, climate deniers that you still uh, talk with here, you know, Certainly, um, I'd be happy to chat with them um, because things don't look good, and and it's going it's going to hell in a handcart pretty quickly. We really only have about thirty years 
to uh, straighten ourselves out. And frankly, you know, it might be a little too late at the moment. And, and are we doing enough, Adam? Is our industry, our academics, our policymakers and government, are we moving in the right direction in your mind? We are moving in the right direction. Are we doing not enough? Definitely not. No, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a really difficult change. You know, we do need to, we do need to become transformative. We need to transform our society away from this fossil fuel based society for, mm -hmm. like I said, just our living, our recreation, our work towards something that, that, that depends a lot more on renewable energy. We're making some important strides. Um, and every day, you know, I read something in the newspaper and the scientific journals of some new progress that we're making in terms of renewable energy. Um, but it's just not moving fast enough and we have to accelerate that change. And it has to be transformative. You know, we can't just, you know, can't just, you know, play around on the margins of things, you know, just because, you know, Fennec drives uh, an electric car, that's not gonna change, uh, change the world. We've got to think about all of our contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, in the Navy, you know, when you were altering the ship to avoid another ship, uh, they would always say, make bold alterations. Don't just pick away at it. You got to make bold alterations. And from what I'm hearing, we're, we're in that stage right now where we need to make the bold alterations. W what is, in your opinion, you say electric cars. I I'm fascinated. I, I have two electric cars in my, in my household. And I'm fascinated at so little government incentivization to drive electric cars. I mean, there's virtually, in, in this province, virtually none. I mean, other than they give you your license for free, I think that's about it. But, um, and then you look at provinces like Ontario, where they had wonderful uh, incentivized, incentive packages and they took them away. Well, where's the mindset there? I would think that getting everybody into the electric cars is a heck of a good start. Well, I think it's I think it's just something about the power relationships in our society, and uh, you always have to you always have to follow the money, you know that's what they always say. And so, who benefits and who doesn't? Uh, some of the positive signs is that even a lot of the oil and gas companies are are you know investing heavily in renewable energy now because that's where the next dollars are going to be. But if you look at the top ten corporations in the world, I think it's six or eight of them. I guess things are changing with all these um, uh, computer companies and all that sort of thing. But the majority of them are uh, either oil and gas or their automobile industry. And so they certainly have a large say in how our society is built and how it functions. Jerry, I know there's not many electric vehicles in Newfoundland. Uh, I had driven across Newfoundland three times this summer, and I'm sure I'm glad I didn't do it in an electric car. It's tough enough in a gas car, find a gas station. I can't imagine what it would be like to power up. But, yeah, I think Newfoundland is not quite there yet, are they, Jerry? No. I mean, it's interesting, though, uh, Adam and Alan, we, there's a huge debate here right now. Uh, the oil industry has taken a massive blow due to COVID, multiple fields are not operational, mass layoffs for people in the oil industry. But you're right, Alan, uh, you know, I, I don't yet have an electric vehicle. I've been reading about it for, geez, I'd say close to 10 years. Um, but that investment is difficult one um, based on my family's needs and the inability to charge the bloody thing, you know, and that, kind of pisses me off, frankly, because we need to move further and faster ahead. Uh, I got a heat pump installed in my house, Adam, uh, about four or five years ago, and I'm really happy with that machine. That is an amazing piece of equipment. I, I continue to go out. Whenever I'm outside, I look at it and say, what an innovation, you know? Uh, just from a comfort perspective, and I know that it's reduced the amount of energy that I've required in my house. But, well, you'll uh, link yeah, that up uh, to uh, some solar panels, and you'll be, uh, you know, you'll be in like Flynn, as they say, because uh, you know you won't need to uh, 
you know, won't need to have to pay for any of that energy. Um, yeah, if, 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 if I had to say about electric vehicles, um, what convinced me was just what a beautiful vehicle it was, regardless of whether it was electric or not, when I sat in a Tesla and uh, first time that I sat in one, just sitting in one, um, that it seemed like it was so innovative in its redesign of what an automobile should be. And I just kept thinking, you know, why is it that it takes some upstart electric vehicle company, you know, to advance the fundamental design of an automobile? Um, and I'm just talking from door handles to mm -hmm. uh, uh, stick shifts to um, yeah. turning on your wipers. Uh, yeah immediately that's what got me and then as soon as i drove a tesla uh i can't imagine why anybody would want anything different in terms of the acceleration the performance um uh you know the cost certainly is an issue um but if you're going to be paying for a high-end vehicle that's gas driven i uh, i challenge everybody to just go out and test drive a tesla and you'll want to buy it not because it's an electric vehicle, but because it's uh, it's a beautiful vehicle. And you know, when you talk about well, you know, charging, um, it's it's these mindsets, it's these paradigms that we have that we need to shift. Um, because I've had people say, you know, until I can go and charge in three minutes, like I can fill up a gasoline, I'm not going to change, uh, or I'm not going to buy a, an electric vehicle. But like that just doesn't make sense because, you know, you can't drive home and fill up your car with gasoline at night, but you can with a charge. So you just have to think about it differently. Most of our travel, very few of us would be traveling longer distances than what some of these uh, Tesla batteries can take us in a car. Um, you know, I can go from tip to tip in uh, PEI uh with that type of a charge um i you know and overnight you know most of our driving is to and from work taking the kids to school and back all that kind of stuff so you know we, we always seem to look for excuses to change yeah. let's 100%. just stop looking for excuses and embrace the change is a wonderful thing a hundred percent out of you you're so you, you hit the nail right on the head there it's uh when you sit behind the wheel of a Tesla, it's a different experience. Even before you hit the acceleration, you know there's something different about it. It's almost like you're immersed in a computer. You're in the middle of this computer, and 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 that's the way I kind of look at it. And, and you're right about the charging. I mean, in fact, electric uh, cars are much more convenient. You, you never have to stand out in the cold and pump gas or anything like that. The car's charged the minute you leave the house. And uh, unless you're going on a road trip, and even the road trips are very easy now because there's so many charging points along the way. But it's right. It's, it's people. It's the mindset. It's that refusing to change. And But I think it's uh, certainly, you know, when people start moving in that direction, it's going to happen rapidly. And that's one aspect of the whole thing. What do you think are the other big, the big pieces we need to shift as a society in order to kind of, to make those bold changes that you talk about electric mobility being one for sure. What else would you suggest as something that we could do at home or, or what, or as a society? Well, uh, there's a there's a book called the um, uh, by Jeremy Rifkin the um, that talks about how society really needs to transform. But it's understandable. Like one of the things is that every building should be responsible for its own energy requirements, and they should be linked to close buildings in case some needs some special loading. Um, you know, it always, <laughs> it always amazes me, like when there's some um, huge storm and uh, a lot of our uh, electricity poles are blown down. Uh, it always becomes the argument of, you know, do we just replace those or do we put the wires underground? There's never the discussion of, well, why do we need to transport energy 
yeah. so far long distances. I mean, it served us really well. Don't get me wrong. I'm not being unappreciative of the last hundred years <laughs> where it really helped in the development of our society, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's what's really helped build places like North America is there our ability to be able to transmit and trans, uh, transport uh, electricity large distances. But I think that whole paradigm needs to shift. I, um, uh, the third industrial revolution by Jeremy Rifkin says that you need to, every building should be responsible. And that's geothermal, you know, that's getting the, the, the heat and the cooling from the ground. So that's what you can do to heat and cool your house. Using renewable energy to supplement. So things like solar, take advantage of wind. Um, we've had some really big issue. The small wind turbines really haven't provided that much um, support or energy to the households. But, you know, we haven't put humans' ingenuity um, into all of this totally. But I think it would also help in the security of our electrical systems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we had a, uh, a blackout in Charlotte and surroundings for two hours today. And those sorts of things just make me uh, realize that, you know, if we had our own, if we were responsible for our own, each building, energy, um, electricity system, um, they're, they're probably, it would make for a much more stable system as well. Uh, but again, there are some issues with power relationships, right? We have these large companies that their existence depends on producing uh, energy to us. So um, we need to really shift. That's one, that's one uh, aspect. And, and the, this idea that I said of, of being able, to, <laughs> Rifkin calls it the, um, uh, the energy internet, that you can connect different buildings so that peak loads can be shared um, uh, between buildings. I, I live kind of in the middle of nowhere out here on Argyle Shore in Prince Edward Island, um, but there are other places around the world where it is more compact and so that you can have that kind of, kind of sharing. Um, Rifkin also talks about um, uh, manufacturing. And uh, right now, there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that go to shipping raw materials and finished goods all around the world. Mm -hmm. Billions and billions of dollars. It's great for, uh, you know, this, this integrated global economy is really great for alleviating poverty. But it's really, it's really bad for, um, for the environment. And so Rick says that because of our advances in, in 3D printing technology, that we can now use, um, metals, we can use concrete, we don't just have to use the polymers or the plastics, um, that there should be just this one th large 3D printing facility um, for each major uh, you know, human center. And so that if you needed something, um, you're purchasing the plans uh, right. that you could send to the printer uh, for it to be produced so that you're not shipping these goods and uh, goods and raw materials all around the world. Uh, you can do it a lot more efficiently. So those are just two of the sort of um, uh, uh, innovative, transformative ways in which we're going to have to live our lives a, a lot differently. Now, COVID has told us that some of us can uh, thrive in changes in our environments. Uh, but it's really difficult and it's you get a sense of loss like it's not that I don't have compassion for people who don't want to change right it's a, mm -hmm. it's a sense of loss that we have and and we mourn the loss of the way things used to be that's why nostalgia is so good that's why when we hear our favorite songs on the radio or you know we hear we smell that bread that reminds us of a, of what our father used to bake on sunday mornings or you know the candies that we used to eat as a child um that's those are very powerful powerful forces and so i think that the psychology of climate change uh that there's a you know there's a lot to be done in that area um especially you know especially in mental health right you know when you go through these hugely significant um, 
uh, extreme events, climate events like hurricanes or flooding events, it really can affect one's own psyche. Um, and apparently there was, you know, because of this kind of hopelessness in trying to respond to climate change, that, you know, a lot of teenagers of today uh, are really having mental health issues just because it's sort of like, well, you know, so what, you know, in 30 years, Fennec says that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. So, yeah. Do you so think that, these are some areas I think that need to be looked at. Do you think that next generation of people coming through are mu more focused on it than perhaps we were? Than uh, definitely, and uh, they're uh, you know they're, they're the ones that give me hope. Right. Right. Um, I have three adult children. Um, and so I have, to, I have to dream of a better world because that's their future. But the students that I teach at the University of Prince Edward Island, they're the ones that give me hope because they're so interested. Mm -hmm. when you wouldn't, I cannot believe the amount of attention that I can garner talking about these environmental issues to students at the university. Um, and they get it and they, they don't have the the creature comforts that the rest of us have come to uh, enjoy. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually we won't have bad habits to undo to uh, try and save the world. Uh, but we're, we're, we're entering the panic stage fairly soon. We've got our own, our own crisis to deal with right now with COVID-19. But believe me, this is coming up behind. And it's not really climate change, folks. Let me tell you this. If we could cure climate change tomorrow and resolve it, I'll tell you immediately that there'd be another environmental issue right behind it because we just have this very poor relationship with our natural environment that we need to change, right? Because if, if climate change is solved, you're gonna have water scarcity is gonna be your next issue or um, uh, declining biodiversity, uh, uh, you know, a lack of forest, you know, we're just, we're really, taken our turn to this, uh, to the environment. And that whole relationship needs to be changed. That's why, in my opinion, that's why we need to turn to some of our First Nations because they do have this better relationship with trying to protect, you know, uh, the natural environment because it provides so much, some wonderful things to us. That's a very, um, go ahead, Jerry. I love that. Well, uh, you know, I just, I, I, you know what popped into my mind? We just came through Christmas. The thought of people cutting down a Christmas tree <laughs> to put it in their house for a couple of weeks. Good God. I, I mean, uh, it, I, I just, you know, my wife and I got away from that about 20 years ago, but it, it really strikes to me, even if it's grown on a farm, I just think the epitome of of uh i guess consumerism and consumption is is that um but it's i, I just I, I haven't asked many questions i'm just listening to you it's fascinating um anyway well here on the island they supply those old christmas trees to the goats and uh you know for their feed so it's it's it's, yeah. it's it, it's a full it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, circular thing we've got going on here in PEI with Christmas trees. I wish though I had an artificial tree like you, Jerry. Can you have <laughs> Kelly talk to Janet? Because I'd like to get that. Out so I don't have to sweep up the needles. But it, <laughs> sorry for insulting you, Alan. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't get uh, that. That's the thing is that we're all guilty of. There's nobody who's pure when it comes to the environment. Believe me. Um, you know anybody who tries to challenge me. I can go right back at them for virtually everything that we do because it does have this this huge impact. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing better, and that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we shouldn't try. Which you know we're all trying. Uh, most of the people I know are, are trying hard. Um, so Adam, but, sorry for uh, interrupting. You're saying you get cha you get challenged sometimes. I guess being <laughs> on the forefront, you're you're an easy well, target. Because, are you not? You know, well, yeah, and be, you know, I, I didn't become a climatologist 32 years ago to travel around the world on airplanes, um, you know, burning uh, fossil fuels about five times more than the average Canadian, right? I <laughs> never knew that, you know, I didn't join it to think that I would be in demand to be traveling around the world. I mean, in, in my own belief is that, you know, we all live with contradictions in our lives is one thing. 
Um, and what I, my, what makes me sleep at night is that, you know, I, I always hope that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to advance and, and make things that much better. And so I have to give this kind of sacrifice of, of polluting so that I can help the whole world stop mm. polluting. So it's, uh, I know it's a contradiction, but, you know, we all have to live with contradictions in our lives. Adam, I, I mean, I want to explore a couple of things. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the whole Nobel Peace Prize part of your life. But I, but I also, I want to go a little bit back before I get there and talk about uh, your interaction with students and, and nurturing and mentoring that next generation of uh, people that are going to make this planet a better place for us all. You said that that's what makes you excited and that it must be fascinating. It must be like the people that you must interact with on a daily basis in class and in other universities and the like, it must be just fascinating to see their passion for getting this ship back on course. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, and I, I, I don't mean to be critical of other um, faculties, but I used to teach in the business faculty and I just didn't feel the energy or the, the commitment or mm -hmm. the desires that came from the students there that I felt immediately in teaching about the environment. Um, and uh, like I said, it's not just their interest, but it's their uh, their grand desire to make the world a better place. And uh, uh, it's just so nice to, um, to see. And it, it gives me the hope for, uh, for continuing. You know, I talked about 30 years about the world going into hell in a handcart. Um, I was teaching a course um, on, uh, uh, you know, societies and sustainability. So I had to look at, you know, what, what caused societies to collapse in the pre in previous years and had to look at the literature about what's threatening our societies. And I'll tell you, in all these separate disciplines of, you know, I looked at climate change, I looked at water scarcity, looked at biodiversity, I look at uh, toxic chemicals, I looked at all of this, I looked at the oceans and food supply, they all, talked about around the year 2050 that that's when all of this was going to be uh collapsing and uh, you know the separate literature separate modeling was all pointing to that time period and it's the first time i think that we've been able to sort of point our finger mm -hmm. and say you know here's uh here's a time period 2050 that's not very far away right oh. we're in 2021 you know, uh, we're, we're probably going to still, us, us old white guys here are still going to be kicking around at that time. So, uh, you know, so there is, there is a certain urgency that's required. And like I said, though, I'm a, I'm a humanist. I do believe that humans are capable of really great, fantastic things. Um, and I hope that we're able to do the right things at the right time to make sure that the the, the damage that we're going to have to live with is going to be minimized as much as possible. I mean, that, that's what I'm, I'm in the business of looking at climate change adaptation. And what does that mean? Adaptation means living with climate change. So years ago, I've been in this, I've been in adaptation for 20 years. Years ago, 20 years ago, I was realizing that humans weren't going to prevent climate change. We're going to have to live with it at some point. Uh, and that's where we're at now. And we're, we're living at it here on the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast of Canada. We're living with climate change uh, today. You know, we have been for the last five to 10 years, maybe the last 15 years. And except for Canada's North, we're really at the forefront of these changes that are going on. So if you're living in other parts of Canada, maybe you're not seeing them as dramatically as we are, but we're seeing incredible sea level rise and coastal erosion rates increasing. We're seeing um, uh, warmer temperatures, drier conditions, drought for our agriculture. We're also seeing, you know, greater uh, amounts of heat and longer growing seasons. So it's not all negative. We're seeing great tourism here on PEI prior to COVID-19 and that's primarily because we're getting drier and hotter weather and that's what tourists want to have. 
Um, so there's some positives and negatives. And in the short term, a place like Prince Edward Island is probably benefiting from climate change. It's just in the longer term, we're kind of all doomed. And so that we really should be moving our lifestyles, transforming them into this less polluting, uh, better relationship with the environment. And I think there's a, almost a little tragedy or a, a little crisis that we need to do it fairly quickly because things don't, well, you know, when I think of an electric car, think of our, um, our digital cameras. Remember where, uh, you know, the Kodak company, which had been around for a hundred years, you know, mm -hmm. went out of business because uh, they weren't fast enough to move to something, you know, within, I can't remember what they said. Was it like three to five years that the, all cameras, you know, film cameras were no longer being produced. That's really quick. Yeah. Um, electric cars and even self-driving electric cars are probably what's next. Right. And uh, there have been some studies that have said that, you know, just a, a, an individual household will not be able to afford their own car, that there will be these electric self-driving cars that go around that act as our transportation system into the future. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and uh, they said it could happen as quickly as six years from now. Yeah. That well, would be scare. If I was, if I was Ford Motor Company, I'd be pretty scared about that. <laughs> you oh, can yeah. see, you can see that the, it's moving in that. I mean, in an urban center, everybody, why would you need those cars? Right. If you could just yeah. autonomously move people around. I remember a few years back, I was on a business trip uh, to Mercedes in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and uh, it was one of the plants that made the C-Series car there. And at about 10 kilometers back from the main gate of the facility, which I think there was, I think there was 8,000 people per shift and they were running 24 hours a day, three shifts. Um, I think every, about 10 kilometers coming back, big Mercedes sign saying the future is electric. The future is electric. They were just pumping their message home in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I mean, this is the home of the internal combustion engine. Like, I mean, this is, you know, and uh, it was just amazing that how fast this change is upon us. But it's an exciting time. It's um, funny, uh, Alan, I got to mention, uh, I just read an article that the CEO of Toyota Motor, Motor Corporation mentioned Elon Musk. And I was, you know, my 30 years in business, one of the things I was always told, don't acknowledge your competition. <laughs> but he was very, uh, pretty de derogatory and dismissive about Elon Musk. And it struck me in reading that article uh, that obviously he's nervous, even yeah. though he sells, what, 20 times more vehicles? To, to listen to you both. And I did have the benefit of sitting in one. I don't own um, a Tesla, but I sat in one in Florida. And you're right. Adam, it's beautiful. But I, I want to mention uh, Newfoundland uh, got hit by a hurricane, Hurricane Igor, in 2010. You may remember that. And it, it, as you were talking, I just brought it up in Google. I remember being in my office as that hurricane was hitting. And I did not, we're in a, a mall. I did not think that that building was going to survive. It was horrendous uh i noticed uh, you know wind speeds 250 kilometers an hour some of the clarenville area got hit the most but i remember driving through there a couple of weeks later and we're not talking about small chasms we're talking about these massive roads like it took months to repair the damage and mm -hmm. that's a decade ago right yeah. yeah adam tell us about uh 2007 journey to the Nobel Peace Prize, a large group of people. What was that whole experience like for you? I mean, that's got to be a fascinating thing to be a part of. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you don't, you don't do things for prizes. Um, no. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe people looking for money do. Uh, I don't know. You know, you, I was kind of doing my job. I was started, I was part of the, uh, the first assessment report, they call it. Um, so way back in 1989, 88, 89, I was part of the uh, original Canadian team of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I was a young scientist back then. There were probably only about 300 at the time. Now there's, you know, uh, almost 10,000, I think, participate in each uh, 
uh, what we call a science assessment. Um, takes about seven years now. It's a really bureaucratic uh, legal process where back in my day, it was just a bunch of us getting together with, uh, you know, with, um, uh, at the time it was still the, the, the Soviet Union, uh, the USSR scientists. I had to be, I had to be um, uh, briefed by the RCMP on ways in which uh, the, uh, the USSR scientists were going to try and entrap me <laughs> so that they would try and get me to be a spy and, and tell you the truth, every single thing they told me, the USSR scientists really did try. Oh, really? Um, so it's really intriguing. Um, but at the time, it was just nice that, you know, scientists were still able, uh, you know, the younger listeners will not remember what it was like during the Cold War. Um, but it was just so enlightening to me as a young scientist. Uh, well, back in 89, I'd be about 25 years old. Wow, that sounds like a long time ago. Um, uh, just being able to uh, uh, work with these folks and seeing these different ways of life. I mean, I do find that one of the difficulties with us, uh, there's not as much um, uh, critical discourse about different ways of living our lives. Like back then, we had a very clear communism versus capitalism, which allowed us at least to discuss the two and see, well, where, where do we want to land ourselves? Where right now, you know, there's different forms of capitalism, but we're all pretty much a capitalistic uh, society across the world. Um, and it just doesn't get that same critical discourse that I think is necessary for us to say that we, should, we can live our lives a lot of, uh, differently if we wanted to. Mm. Um, so, you know, I was, I was actually in Panama, <laughs> of all places, in uh, 2007, and I, was, <laughs> I picked up the USA today, and uh, I was having breakfast, and uh, uh, I said, oh, I guess I just won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and so, you know, I just, I honestly thought of it as kind of a little joke, you know, like, hey, we just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, then... Um, uh, the the director of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Pachori, uh, he uh, he sent out a note to everybody, and so it, it saying, you know, I guess we can call ourselves Nobel laureates, which we don't. Right. Um, uh, but that kind of knocked home, and then everybody wanted to then recognize, right? So right. the 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 federal government wanted to recognize the. Um, the directorate I wanted to work in, the, the, the group I wanted to work in. And so I have these series of, um, of recognitions, I guess, as being part of that larger group right. um, that had been part of the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I had just, um, I was part of the assessment that was going on at that time as well, um, but it had grown so large. I mean, I think that was the last, IPCC that I ever participated in because it is this large bureaucratic exercise. Um, but like I said, it, it was, uh, I don't take it too seriously um, because it was, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people that I shared it with. It's not like, uh, and I oh. would never call myself a Nobel laureate. Um, but it's nice. It is, it is, I guess, uh, nice when when you know the work that you do because you because for good you know i'm hoping that it helps the world that it gets recognized um elsewhere so i thought that that was uh that was uh quite nice no that's the humility is unbelievable come on that's a fantastic thing you did that's great jerry can you imagine you just yeah <laughs> well uh, you know, as we tease this uh, podcast, I will play up the Nobel Prize piece <laughs> a little bit, uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> the Peace uh, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, right? Because, you know, I don't want to take that dynamiter's uh, money. Um, there was, uh, you know, the Nobel was, uh, he, he had invented dynamite and made a lot of money for killing people. Well, I guess it was dynamite didn't just kill people. Dynamite was good for blasting rocks and things. <laughs> and uh, so, so people, people have rejected the uh, Nobel prizes in the uh, past. Yeah, this is the Peace Prize. So the Peace Prize, I, I feel very, very honored to just have been a part of a group that was, that was recognized because it, was, it wasn't even won by the IPCC. It was co-won because Al Gore 
won the other half and shared in the other half of the uh, the prize money. Wow, um, Adam, a fascinating discussion. So much to think about uh, here tonight, and we really appreciate it. Um, you know, it, this is a tough one for you because. Uh, there's just so much at stake and there's so much to be done. But we, all, we often ask our guests to leave the audience with one piece of advice. We like to have these conversations, but we like the audience to take something away. What is that one piece of advice, one thing I could take away from the conversation? And that's a big ask for you because there's a lot at stake right now. Um, but what, what would you say that one piece is? Well, you know, we we often get advice, and especially during this time of year, um, just following the the holidays, of you know uh, taking care of ourselves and taking care of our fellow humans. Um, uh, I think the advice would be uh, make sure that you're taking care of nature as well. It's a uh, it's a very resilient force, nature, um, and so it we've taken it so much for granted over the years. Um, you know, 30 years ago when I first started teaching, if I asked students, you know, do you think that humans could have the power to influence uh, natural systems in a large way, global natural processes? They would have said no. Um, we've changed that paradigm because if I ask my students now, they all say, yes, we can understand that. But it took us a long time to understand that these little bits of humans doing these little bits of things cumulatively add up to some pretty huge damage on our overall planet. Um, we're, we're learning more and more. People are changing their views more and more. Um, but I think if there's some advice, it would be, you know, for that, goodness that we try to do for ourselves and our family and our fellow humans let's let's make sure we do a good turn to uh, to nature as well because that's our future it's been our past it's our future and it's going to define everything about us you know people are wanting to go to mars you know because we're screwing up this planet well that's the wrong thing you know let's let's not screw up this planet um, and let's make sure we can take care of it uh, going into the future. And let me just say one last thing is that, Alan, I can now call myself a true Islander too because I married a potato farmer's daughter just a couple of years ago. So I consider myself a true Islander. I've made the full, the full turn. <laughs> now, hold on a second, Adam. I got to jump in here because... You, you, I, I'm not an Islander. I'm, uh, I'm, well, I'm a Newfoundlander. You should consider yourself an because, Islander because you married an Islander. Right. I married an Islander. But uh, Jerry, uh, you're going to like this story, and, and maybe the audience will as well. But a few years back, there was guys debating uh, in the western part of Prince Edward Island, one particular guy that was new to the village. And they said, well, where's he from? And they couldn't quite figure it out. It turns out the fellow was... Uh, conceived on the ferry. <laughs> so they still debated this for a little bit longer because they needed to determine which way the ferry was going. Was it coming to PEI or going to Nova Scotia? <laughs> that would determine whether it was an island. <laughs> I tell you, the bar is high. <laughs> it's very high. It's very high. <laughs> Jerry, any last uh, minute thoughts? Well, it's just, it's fascinating, Adam. As Alan said, you know, to try and ask you to come up with one thing. It's uh, the, the climate that we live in and being Maritimers and, and feeling the wind and the, the differences of, of, of uh, weather. My, my brother-in-law lived in Qatar for a period of time and he said every morning he got up, sunshine, it got to him. Uh, here we're blessed with change. Uh, but, uh, you know, I definitely don't want to go into the change that you are saying we're heading, you know. Uh, I think my experience is, you know, I've got a background in, in geography, but I, I'm going to, you've reignited my passion for, uh, for the climate. And uh, I just appreciate you coming on board with us today. And hopefully, you know, some of the viewers uh, delve into it and make some changes themselves. So thanks. Well, ladies Thank you guys so much. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was Gale Force Wins, and uh, I can't begin to thank you enough, Adam, for a wonderful conversation. There's work to be done, for sure. You've taught us some great things here tonight, certainly opened our eyes to a lot of things. Uh, you're a wonderful guy to have on the show with us. You're a wonderful guy to make Atlantic Canada your home. We are sure happy to have you here. And uh, on behalf of the entire audience, we appreciate your time. The end of the day, the world needs more Adam Fennec. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Wins. That's Gale Force Wins, W-I-N-S dot com.